Hey guys, and welcome back. In today's episode, we're going to cover how to taxi, take off, and land in the A10. If you'd like to do this on your own, you can go into the instant action and do the takeoff section. When you spawn on this mission, you're actually going to have the aircraft ready to go on the runway, good for takeoff. But you're going to hear that beeping noise in the background. This is the tack end, and we need to turn that off. This is how you do that. Okie dokie. And with that, let's get to the taxi. In the actual manual, it tells you that as you start rolling down the runway, when you hit 80 knots, you're supposed to turn the nose wheel steering off. This allows for the rudders to take over because nose wheel steering may be a little bit too sensitive in order to steer when you're going that fast. So with the nose wheel steering engaged, what's happening is that as I move my rudders, both my nose wheel and my rudders in the back are moving. But if I switch the nose wheel steering off, you will notice that my rudder inputs are only in the back and not the nose of the aircraft. The theory is that at 80 knots or even higher, you should have a sufficient airflow going over the tail that it will allow you to steer the aircraft while you're taking off without you careening off the runway. The reality in DCS is, as long as you have some sort of rudder pedals or twist joystick, you should be fine even with leaving the nose with steering on during rollout. Now, let's talk about some numbers. In order for you to take off, you're gonna need to rotate. You're gonna pull back on the stick, and as she goes nose up, you're gonna let go a little bit so you don't keep pulling back, and you're gonna let her gently take off on her own. Now, the rotation speed in the A10 is roughly somewhere around the 120 knot mark. Now, should you be heavier if you have a lot of fuel or weapons on board, you may need to increase that by five to 10 knots, it depends. When you take off, all you need to do is raise your gear once you have a positive rate of climb, raise your flaps, and you're good to go. Couldn't be any easier. Landing, however, it's a little bit more tricky, and we're gonna go over that once we're in the air. Now, at first, we're just gonna take off, we're gonna go back, and we're gonna try and land from really far away. Then, we're gonna come back and try and land within the pattern. And lastly, I'm gonna show you how to land using the poppy lights. But before we do any of that, we also should understand how to taxi the aircraft. Some people tend to do this really, really fast, and that's not the way of doing it, especially with a loaded A-10. Now, because this is a heavy aircraft and the engines have a really low response, you're gonna see that you're gonna need to apply quite a bit of power to get her rolling, and then you're going to power back once you've gone over the moment of inertia. Let me show you what I mean. So if I just wanted to taxi, apply a lot of power, and then throttle back once you're moving. Not all the way, just keep some power in there. And now we're rolling. So here we have a 90 degree turn. We're gonna taxi to the right. I'm gonna tap the brakes a little bit. And start turning. Notice how she starts leaning a little bit to the left. And the heavier you are, the more of that lean you're gonna see. And if you're a little bit too fast, you will tip the aircraft. So this is about as fast as you wanna be when you're taxiing around. Also, be mindful of any potholes. Sometimes you're gonna see some dark hole textures on a runway or a taxiway. Now, this happens for several different reasons. Someone might have bombed the runway. Someone might have crashed and created a crater. If, for some reason, you run over that crater, you can either die or you will have damaged your gear. On the left-hand side, you see the gear handle. And this is what we're going to use to move the gear up and down, or you can hit G on the keyboard. And here you have the three lights. This indicates that we have our left, nose, and right gear down and locked, along with the flaps indicator. Let's say you were kind of dumb and you went over that pothole. You take off, and that gear goes up and that gear warning does not go away. After about a good 15 seconds or so, you start getting worried, you take a look, and you see that two of the lights might have disappeared, but the left light is on. Unfortunately, you have broken the left gear and it is stuck in the down position. The gear horn will not shut up. In order for you to silence the gear horn, you need to hit the LG warning silence, landing gear warning silence. Once you do that, the landing gear will stop, and you're gonna need to come back for a landing and repair the aircraft. Okie dokie, so let's go ahead and try and take off with this aircraft. The plan is, I'm gonna go ahead and keep her on their center line, 
I'm going to rotate at 120 knots, and I'm going to let her get off the ground by herself. And then we're going to enter a left pattern, and we're going to go way out that way and try and set up for a nice landing on this runway. Now notice that this runway says 07. If I hit F10 on the keyboard, and let's say the map is somewhere here, and you want to find out where you are, you just simply go up here and press this button, zoom all the way in, and it centers around you. Now, if I take a look, I see that this runway has runway 07, and on the opposite side, it has runway 25. Now, this indicates 250, so it is a magnetic heading of 250 going this way, and the way we're taking off is a magnetic heading of 070. Now, the reason why this is important is because it makes your pattern work really easy. If we use this gadget, this is called the HSI, or the Horizontal Situation Indicator. We're going to go over this thing in depth later, but it's a very simple gadget, basically just your compass. Now, we're worried about this inner needle here, and we can change this to whatever we like with the course set. And I'm going to set it to 070, which is roughly the magnetic heading of this runway. And what we're going to be able to do is utilize this gadget so that when we're doing pattern work, and we need to do a nice perpendicular or parallel movement with this runway, we can reference this gadget to make ourselves aligned perfectly. We have traffic behind us, so let's go ahead and take off. Remember, we're gonna roll forward, 100%, keep her down the runway. We're not gonna turn off nose with steering. And about 120 knots, we're gonna rotate. Our speed will be indicated on this left-hand side here. 100, 120, rotate, let go a little bit, and we're already up in the air. Look at that. We're positive rate, so we're going to hit G. There's that alarm. Alarm is gone. All the gear has collapsed. Let's raise our flaps. Perfect. All right, so I'm up in the air, and I'm just making a very quick note here, because this is mainly for the guys who have maybe played the A-10 and are getting back into it. Uh, previously, whenever there was a problem with the A-10, uh, you would have the master warning going off and the master caution going off right here at the same time. This has now been changed as of today. Uh, so the gear still makes the same noise. So the gear handle will light up and you have the gear horn, and as the gear is moving down, it's making the noise until the gears are down and locked, and then we can raise it up again. And now we know that the gears are up and there are no lights, which means that there is no failures of the gear. Now, if there's a failure of the aircraft, I'm going to simulate it. Warning, autopilot. Notice that there's no more warning horn, and the only caution that we get is the master caution going off. So, now we need to take a look at what the problem is. EAC. Let's fix that. Done. Problems went away. And we can use autopilot again. So, just a very good quick note. If there is a problem with the aircraft, the master caution sound no longer goes off. That sound is now purely reserved for whenever the gear goes up or down. While we're in the air, I might as well go over really quickly some of the little sounds that the A-10 is going to make. There are two particular sounds that you need to keep track of, and that would be this sound. So this is a solid tone, and this is the chop nose tone. So as you see, whenever I enter the choppy noise tone, the wing stalls, while whenever I'm in the solid tone, the aircraft is still handling just fine. Now, in this version, the solid tone indicates that I'm actually turning at the best rate that the aircraft can, given its airspeed and load. However, if you see my stick, trying to ride just the solid tone and not trip into the choppy tone is just a matter of one millimeter pull of the stick. So if you want to get the maximum performance turn out of the A-10, then you need to ride the horn without going to the choppy tone. Uh, this will change slightly when the new version of the A-10 comes out because the solid and chop tones will not stall your wing. 
Instead, you're going to be able to ride between the solid and chop tone, as long as you don't go past the chop tone, and then your wing will stall. I know it's a little complicated, so it's going to be a little more difficult, but when you get in the aircraft and you start practicing, all you need to know is if you want to make the best right turn, you need to practice turning so that you ride the horn like this. This is the other tone that you're going to hear. If the aircraft slows down enough, and your throttles are in the aft section, maybe idle, the aircraft will warn you of a gear horn, because it's going to assume that you're trying to land the aircraft and you've forgotten the gear. And it will shut up once you drop the gear, or if you hit the gear silence button. But since I'm in the air, and I don't want to drop the gear, I'm not landing, the only thing I need to do to get rid of it is throttle up somewhere past the 30% mark and you can see the gear light has gone away and we're okie dokie. And if I throttle back again at a slow airspeed, it starts to flash and go off again. Now as we're passing the runway over here, let's take a look at the speed gauge. Now, when we were on the ground, you will have noticed that the speed indicator on the left-hand side over here was 50 the entire time, and not zero. Why is that? Well, the reason for this is that the speed is referenced by the pitot tube, which is located here. We talked about this during our first lesson. Now, there needs to be enough air flowing through it in order for the pitot tube to actually work, and the minimum speed that's required is 50 knots. So the speed will never go below 50 until you finally go 51 knots or faster. The setup for this will be that we're going to need to decrease speed, we're going to need to aim down just a little bit, and we're going to utilize this little thing right here. This is called the TVV, or the Total Velocity Vector, and it is probably the most important gadget you're going to have on your heads-up display. Don't worry, we're going to go over the heads-up display in the next lesson, where we go over navigation but we're going to utilize this TVV to our advantage. Now what the TVV really is, is kind of like a flight path marker. In essence, it shows you exactly where your aircraft is going. See, right now we're at a cool 3,000 feet and we're not climbing or descending, indicating by the zero over here. And you can see the same thing by this climb indicating gauge, where it's now stationary at zero. If I were to place this total velocity vector right here and hold it here until I crash into the water, I would literally crash right here in this spot because that's where the total velocity vector is pointing us. Now this actually makes it really useful to land because as long as we get ourselves into a nice glide slope towards the runway, all we gotta do is basically place this total velocity vector at the runway's beginning and that is exactly where we're gonna end up, which makes landing this aircraft with the total velocity vector almost cheating. Now, we are pretty far away, so we're not going to start really descending just yet until we get a little bit closer. As we get closer, we're going to configure our aircraft for landing. So, now I'm going to place the total velocity vector at the beginning of the runway. And don't forget that you can trim your aircraft to make life easier. So right now, I need to trim up a little bit, so when I let go of the stick, and I'm not holding anything, she's basically flying by herself. Let's deploy the air brakes. We're below 220 knots, so I'm going to deploy my gear with G. And once it goes below 190 knots, I can deploy my flaps. I'm going to go half flaps. We're pretty light. There's not much on top of us. So we don't even think we need full flaps. You know what? Let's go full flaps anyway. And you'll notice what happens to my total velocity vector when I go to full flaps. It goes up. Because I have increased my lift by increasing my flaps. And now I'm at 148 knots. I'm going to keep descending. Altitude, altitude. I'm going to place the total velocity vector at the beginning of the runway. And I'm going to hold this side picture. And try and move the total velocity vector up or down with my throttle, not my stick. And now I'm going to flare. I'm going to put my throttles to idle. And I'll place the total velocity vector at the end of the runway. The aircraft will gently come down by itself. Notice I wasn't doing anything crazy with the stick. Let's go around and do it again. Flaps to half. Full. Speed brake. 
Speed brake. You're going to get that warning if your speed brakes are up and your throttle goes to 100. So collapse your speed brakes. We're above 120 knots. Rotate. Gear up. Flaps up. Cool. Let's try that again. Okie dokie. I've set myself up for another long landing. We're a little bit fast, 250 knots. I'm going to start descending a little bit here. And I'm going to throttle back. Deploy some speed brakes. The other reason why you want to have speed brakes on is because the A10's engines don't spool very quickly. And should you need really quickly to apply any sort of throttle because of a gust of wind might drop you a little bit and you need to get out of that little gust, then if you go from zero to 100%, look how long it takes for the engine to spool. That takes forever. Meanwhile, if I have some speed brakes deployed and I keep my throttle somewhere up here at 30, 40, 50%, if I need to apply full power, I can do so much quicker. See how quicker that was? So it's a little bit safer for you. Now we're pretty fast. Let's go ahead and deploy Altitude. our gear Altitude. and our flaps to full. Let's see if we can touch down at the right speed of about 120 knots. Anywhere between 120 and 130 knots is pretty much okay. Okay, total velocity vector at the end of the runway. We flared a little bit high and we're gonna bounce here. But it's not drastic, it's not terrible. This is what you would expect from somebody who's trying to learn how to land. We managed to get on the ground, nothing's broken, everything's good. Speed brakes back in, flaps back to half, throttles forward. Rotate speed. And we're back in the air. Gear up, flaps up. We're going to go ahead and make a left hand turn. Once we reach about 800 feet, there's 800. And we're going to go to 1,500 feet. Typically, anywhere between 1,500 and 1,000 is good for a pattern altitude. Official general aviation states that 1,000 feet is the pattern altitude, but since we're learning 1,500 gives us a bit of a buffer. I am looking back to see the runway, but I can also use the HSI to know when I'm actually parallel to the runway. I'm about 1,500, I can trim the aircraft so it stays where it needs to be. And we're about parallel right about now. Great. Okie dokie, so right about here, we can start descending a little bit. Let's drop our gear. And we're only going to start moving to the left as soon as we're about the 7 o'clock position at the end of the runway. Deploy some flaps to half. Remember, the flaps will not deploy until after you've reached below 190 knots. Maintain some speed with throttle. Make sure you don't decrease too much. We're now perpendicular to the runway. Let's square up our pattern. Trim, trim, trim. And I'm going to deploy full flaps right about now. I'm going to need to nose down a little bit to keep that descent rate going. I'm going to turn in now once the runway is about my 10 o'clock position. I haven't deployed any speed brakes yet. I'm going to do that after I've rolled out. Okie dokie. Now I'm going to place a total velocity vector at the beginning of the runway. I'm going to pop a little bit of speed brakes. Get the aircraft altitude, slowed down. Altitude. Throttle up a little bit to maintain the speed. Trim as necessary. It reduces your workload. See, I'm not pitching up and down. I'm using the throttle to move the total velocity vector up and down. Okie dokie. I'm going to go ahead and flare. Throttle's idle. I'm going to keep the total velocity vector at the end of the runway. And that's it. We've landed. Deploy full brakes. Gently apply brakes near the end of the runway. There's absolutely no need for you to have to apply full brakes with the wheels. Right as you touch down. As long as you touch down at the proper speeds. She comes down. I haven't even tapped the brakes yet. 
and she'll almost come to a stop near the end of the runway. So this is how you know that you've done a proper landing. A word of caution. Take a look at nose wheel steering. It's not on by default. So when you are ready to taxi off after you've landed, you're going to, need to manually hit the nose wheel steering button to activate your nose wheel steering, and only then will you be able to actually start rolling. Collapse my speed brakes. Let's get off the runway. Clean up the aircraft, get the flaps up. And because we've been heavily trimming the aircraft while landing, and also while flying, what we want to do is reset the trim of the aircraft. Right now, the stick is kind of pointing in a weird direction. To do that, I'm going to have to move the throttles up a little bit while I hold the brakes down. I'm going to press and hold the takeoff trim until that green light shows up and the stick has centered itself. Now, you just heard a warning go off that had nothing to do with the trim. The aircraft just did a self-alignment test on the ground, kind of like a refresh. And you will also notice, as I've mentioned in the first lesson, our steer points have disappeared. Remember, the remedy for that is to rock the rocker switch. Back to fly plan, and now I have my steer points back again. Okay, guys, there's actually one other thing that I forgot before we move on, and that is crosswind landings. Yes, yeah, so this is something that you are going to experience while you're flying. Um, I've gone to the extreme and I've made the crosswinds come in from here so it's coming towards us and the runway is right over there. So let's come in for a setup and I'll show you how I like to do a crosswind landing. Now don't get too uh, technical about this, just use whatever method you feel is best. Some people will want you to just fly straight towards the runway, kick the rudder to the side and fly it directly towards the runway. The other method would be to, say, tilt the wing into the wing and then use the rudder to the opposite side and keep yourself centered towards the runway. Use whatever works for you. Just remember, the total velocity vector is your best friend and you are going to utilize this in order to put this on the runway. Except, of course, for situations where the total velocity vector is going to be off so far to the side where it's no longer on your heads-up display indicating very, very strong crosswinds. Okay, so as we're trying to get lined up over here, remember the wind is blowing from the right and it is gonna push us to the left. So we are gonna need to crab to the right. As you can tell, it's blowing so hard that the total velocity vector is indicating with an arrow that it is pointing to the left. So in such an extreme case, you may need to actually just look outside your window like so and try and land it based on the ground track that you're looking with the aircraft. And then you're going to kick that rudder in order to make the uh, aircraft be exactly parallel with the runway, the longitudinal axis of your aircraft with the runway, and stick to the right a little bit into the wind so that it doesn't tip over your aircraft to the left. And that's it. It's really not that bad. Let's, uh, let's do this one more time, but with slightly more realistic winds, because that was an extreme case. Okay, the winds are still coming from the same exact position, but they are a lot less violent. And now we can actually use the total velocity vector by placing it on the beginning of the runway like you normally would. It's still indicating the total velocity vector is actually a little bit to the left of what you're looking at right there due to that arrow. But as we get closer, you're going to see that uh, the TVV will come into play. So again, just use the overall ground track. The ground track basically means that even though we're pointing this way, we're actually moving along the ground tracking this way. So just use that information. Now we're still off to the left of the runway. Altitude, altitude. I can tip my right wing into the wing and use left rudder and keep myself centered with the runway. I'm going to try and utilize this form of landing. And when we touch down on the flare, the right wheel will touch down first, then the left, and then the nose wheel.
and boom, we're on the ground. Was that dramatic at all? No. Does it require practice? Sure. So get to it. And remember, if it doesn't look right, you can always go around. You can always go around If it don't look right, coming down Okie dokie, let's talk about the poppy lights. The poppy lights aren't located everywhere, but they do exist on some airports. I'm currently over here at Tbilisi, and this runway has poppy lights. They've been recognized by four lights. They will be intermittent with red and white, or all red and all white. Now, the reason for these poppy lights is to give you a precision approach into the airfield in order to clear obstacles that are on the ground. Let's say there's trees, power lines, buildings, or whatever have you. They want you to be able to land at this runway at a nice three degree glide slope in order to touch down and be safe about it. What you're looking for is two white and two red lights. The more red you see, the lower you are below glide slope. The more white you see, the higher you are above the glide slope. So two white and two red means you're on a perfect three degree glide slope to the runway. All right, the lights just popped up and ha, huh, look at that, two white, two red. So at this stage, what I want to do is maintain this glide slope all the way to the runway. But we don't even have our gear down, so let's go ahead and set that up. Gears down. Flaps are going to go to half. They're not going to deploy until I go 190 knots. Deploy altitude, some speed rates. Altitude. There's 190. The flaps have come down. I'm going to pitch down a little bit. Place that total velocity vector on the end of the runway. Throttle up a little bit so I don't lose too much speed. There we go. And I'm gonna trim. Trim, 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 trim. There we go. And we're clearing all these obstacles. Look how low we are to the ground. I would even go three white, one red. Now we're a little bit below glide slope, but we've cleared the obstacles, so we're actually safe. But at this stage, you can see how three red and one white gets us pretty low to the ground. We really don't want that. But once you're close enough, you can ignore the poppy lights and just do a visual landing. There we go. Nice, gentle touchdown. Bada beam, bada boom. So as you can see, the poppy lights can be very helpful in giving us a precision approach to landing. Anyway, I hope this was helpful for you guys, and I will see you in the next lesson, where we start to go over all of the features for the navigation of the A-10, including autopilot and the heads-up display, along with the TAD and all of its features. Until next time, see you guys.